Oh, hey there. Come on in. We're just about to start. Welcome to My Wife the Dietitian, a fun weekly podcast about nutrition and healthy lifestyle. I'm Rob, and together with my wife Sandra, we invite you to join us on this informative and entertaining journey through the complex world of healthy eating. Join us each week as we strive to help you with transforming your overall health and relationship with food through up to date, evidence based nutrition information. Do you wonder why people talk about eating fish and all the nutritional benefits? Have you heard about the pescatarian diet? Well, today we have an expert on our podcast, someone who wrote the pescatarian cookbook, Kara Harbstreet, dietitian from Street Smart Nutrition. I do think the diet labels can be constricting. And one thing that I love to use when I'm working with clients or just speaking generally about nutrition is a little phrase that can be helpful for that nuance or flexibility that we might be craving. And that phrase is for the most part. So we might say, well, for the most part, I follow a pescatarian diet. But when my mother makes this chicken dish that I love, you know, that kind of becomes the exception to for the most part. Stay tuned. Enjoying the show? You can help others find it and enjoy it too by giving us a five-star rating or review. If you feel like reaching out to us with a question or comment, you can send us an email at mywifetherd at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit our website at mywifethedietitian.com, as well as our social media pages. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Enjoy the show. Welcome to My Wife the Dietitian. Hello, Sandra. Hi, Rob. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Good. We're talking to author and dietitian Kara Harbstreet from Street Smart Nutrition today. Oh, great name. About her pescatarian cookbook and all about pescatarian eating. Which is fish and seafood, right? Yeah. That's what pescatarian is. Yeah, it yeah. is. But we talk, we get right into it. We dive deep into the various vegetarian diets, including the pescatarian. So it's a really good episode. Awesome. Well, that'll be uh, enlightening. I can't wait to hear all about eating pescatarian. Hi, Kara. Thanks so much for joining us today. Can you tell the listeners what you do and who you help in your work? Hello. Thanks so much for having me on this episode. So I'm Kara Harbstreet. I'm a Kansas City-based registered dietitian, and I work primarily in private practice in nutrition communications, which means, you know, in more or less the sense of helping everyone, I can work with someone one-on-one and take a really deep dive into their individual nutrition, um, as well as, you know, just broader communications out to the general public through a variety of different platforms, mostly social media these days, as well as some digital and print publications. But my background area is pretty diverse. I really love working with athletes. I'm a former athlete myself. And so when I think of, you know, the clients that get me really excited to come to work in the morning, it's, you know, the folks who are really similar to me, they're really looking to dial in their nutrition for an upcoming race or event. Maybe they're transitioning, you know, out of sport or returning from an injury. Uh, but the common theme that runs throughout is using a weight inclusive and non-diet framework. So just a very gentle approach to nutrition that is very much still rooted in evidence-based practice. Love that. Awesome. Wow. That's like a diverse uh, practice. And it's very, um, I love that uh, you're passionate about helping people kind of that you used to be like uh, as an athlete and uh, fueling up for events and different runs. And you recently wrote a cookbook called Pescatarian Cookbook. Yes, that's correct. It's been out for, I think, long enough to to have made my way through all of my own recipes at least several times. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh my gosh. Yeah. What a process of writing a cookbook. That's good. So can you tell us what is a pescatarian? Absolutely. So a pescatarian diet can actually be quite broad. And in working with folks who, who try to follow that eating pattern, um, you do see a lot of diversity. So the pesca aspect of the pescatarian diet refers to fish and seafood. So that could range from, you know, our 
canned or pouched tuna all the way up to fresh caught, frozen seafood, any and everything in between. But there are variations of a pescatarian eating pattern. So within that, someone who does include fish and seafood may choose to include eggs um, or dairy, as well as, you know, other potentially animal-based protein sources, or they may not. So you may be familiar with terms like a lacto-ovo-vegetarian or a lacto-vegetarian. One common theme is that none of these approaches are vegan because, again, whether you're including fish or seafood, as well as eggs or dairy, there are still those those animal-based foods included. Right, right. And actually, we did have some previous episodes. We interviewed Scott Fickerson, who's a professor in California, and he uh, coaches vegan. He's a vegan himself, and he does uh, vegan eating for runners. And so that was a whole episode back in, do you remember, Rob? That was like a year ago now, wasn't it? Yeah, like, I think it was. I don't yeah. know. It's, it's, all a, it's all a blur, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like and then we also- 45 or something like this. It's, yeah, this is a while ago. That's right. And then Vicente Vis- Vicento Molina. Yes, the becoming vegetarian author and becoming vegan. We interviewed her uh, two months or three months ago. And again, we learned all about vegan eating. So that's a little bit different than what you're talking about, which is including fish. And for some people, possibly dairy and eggs, as you mentioned, eh? So would they ever have chicken? It depends. I have definitely counseled on a one-on-one basis, you know, folks who are open to this more omnivorous or varied diet. Um, I think, you know, for chicken and poultry, it really kind of comes down to, I think, a, a few different factors. I know cost is top of mind for so many people right now. We've seen this pretty marked increase in just the cost of food and how much we're spending in the grocery store. So I think, you know, the approach to whether or not to include chicken or poultry alongside fish and seafood um, can sometimes be an interesting conversation. And most of the time I default to taking a very case by case basis instead of broad or very general recommendations because eating is so personalized. Budgets are so personal. You know, these are all considerations that go into it. I know speaking for myself, when I think of, you know, a, a true pescatarian eating pattern, for the most part, it would not include chicken and the, the priority would still be placed on that fish and seafood as a primary animal based protein. However, I do think, you know, when I think of a, a general pescatarian approach, it would still include eggs, dairy, those types of options um, and would need some specificity to say, you know, oh, I'm pescatarian, but I don't include eggs or I'm pescatarian, but I don't include dairy. Oh, right, right. Yeah, that's interesting. Because when I when I think of pescatarian, and when I um, counsel clients who say they are kind of eating mostly fish, I don't even realize that maybe they could like, I mean, it could be eggs and dairy. Also, I just think because it's a pescatarian, I mean, there's so many different definitions for various uh, vegetarian diets. So but I think there is definitely some real um, health benefits with the pescatarian. Like what are the benefits of eating pescatarian? Well, I think several come to mind, but first and foremost is just this increase in those omega-3 fatty acids. Our fish and seafood tend to be some of the most dense sources of those essential fatty acids. And when we scan, you know, the variety of foods that someone might be eating, if we're not finding those coming from other food sources, you know, simply increasing by one or a few servings per week of, of fish and seafood can be a really simple way to automatically increase that, that intake. Our omega-3 fatty acids are so important for a number of different functions in the body, but a lot of people right now are focusing on an anti-inflammatory type of of eating pattern. Um, They're concerned about developing chronic disease in the future. They're really interested in aging well or maintaining the quality of life as they age. And I think that is one of the biggest benefits of having adequate omega-3s. They play such an important role, obviously from the inflammation standpoint and and combating inflammation in the body, but also for for the other body functions and body systems. So we think of brain health, even, you know, eye health, heart health. Um, These are all really important body systems that can deteriorate and, and be more susceptible to the development of chronic disease in the future. So I think a lot of people are viewing that as sort of a, an insurance policy, if you will, of just trying to make an effort to include more of those beneficial nutrients that, that come from fish and seafood. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. 
Rob, have you ever uh, heard of pescatarian or have you thought about that before? Interesting. I was just going to make a, a comment or question, actually. Yeah, I have. I know what pescatarian is. I'm familiar with that. And my question is, for both of you guys, kind of as dietitians, do you find that the labels that we're giving these different diets, like vegetarian and the, the lacto-ovo pescatarian and, you know, all these different kind of labels, do you find that limits what people feel they can eat? You know, like our daughter claims she's vegetarian, but she still likes chicken. And she's like, oh, but I can't eat it because I'm vegetarian. And I'm like, says who? Like, why can't you have a piece of chicken? Like, it's not like nutritionally, it's not going to hurt you, right? It's just your personal choices that are that are limiting your food choices. Do you see what I mean? Like, is it is that creating issues for people, do you think? Well, I can certainly hop in and share from both personal and professional experience that I do think the the diet labels can be constricting. On a personal level, there was a period in my life where I ate predominantly plant-based. And what I noticed was kind of the same phenomenon that you described. You know, we would be at a family function or a potluck or a restaurant, and I would see something being served or on the menu and think, wow, those meatballs really sound delicious. Or like, I can smell that beef stew coming from the kitchen. I'd love to try it. But I would then follow it up with, you know, the food rules that were were enforced by the diet label. So I think we have to be a little bit cautious between, you know, claiming, hey, I prefer to eat vegetarian or I follow a vegetarian eating pattern. I think there's a, a distinct difference between a statement like that and I am vegetarian or I exactly. am vegan. Yeah. At that point, we really brought it into a, a part of our identity. We start to view ourselves through that lens of being a vegan, a vegetarian, a pescatarian. And that's where I think, you know, we, we may need to draw, again, just a, a distinguishing line between what we do and who we are. And one thing that I love to use when I'm working with clients or just speaking generally about nutrition is a little phrase that can be helpful for that nuance or flexibility that we might be craving. And that phrase is for the most part. So we might say, well, for the most part, I follow a pescatarian diet but when my mother makes this chicken dish that I love, you know, that kind of becomes the exception to for the most part. Yeah. I love yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Because there are so many food rules, right? And people do get caught up in their own um, mindset about what, like you just said, what we do versus who we are. And if you always think of yourself as a vegetarian and I can't have that and I can't have that, it's a lot of the limitations and the restrictions and it's self-imposed. So I really like what you said about for the most part, I prefer to eat plant-based or I prefer to eat vegetarian or, uh, you know, just saying for the most part really is a qualifying, um, it kind of gives the out, <laughs> it gives the flexibility. Yeah, I And I, I like to remind people too, that when it comes to those true food preferences, you know, that's very different than a food rule. I do think that some of those diet labels can, you know, edge into the territory of being a, a food rule that is limiting or restrictive. Um, but I would encourage, you know, anyone listening to this conversation or kind of pondering this question at home, like, what are my true food preferences? Am I eating this because it falls into a category I'm comfortable with? Or do I genuinely love the taste, texture, the way it's prepared and served, et cetera? And I think, you know, these are very individual answers to a, a pretty broad question. But at the end of the day, Rob, I heard you say, you know, from a nutritional standpoint, there's really no harm, right? Barring any allergy or intolerance to a certain food or ingredient, you know, for, again, for the most part, these foods do provide benefit and a lot of value from a taste, texture, and nutrition standpoint. Um, so if you are comfortable kind of breaking your food rules, so to speak, or just broadening them up, letting them be more flexible, I do think that in the long run, this is a more sustainable approach to eating because when those restrictions and limitations are lifted, all of a sudden, these are habits that you can really start to build a long-term eating pattern around. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I'd like to think that people are choosing their their diet based on health. You know, like what's good for me? What what foods should I be including in my diet that are, are good for me? Rather than uh, social media tells me I need to eat this way or that way. And, and like you said, you know, putting these arbitrary sort of 
limits on what we're able to eat really restricts what we want to eat. Yeah, I agree. Actually, and and we all, I I like that you do have an intuitive eating aspect to your private practice, Kara. That's what actually led me to wanting to connect with you because I think it is so important that eating, we don't eat just for health. We don't eat just for the fuel of it. We eat for social reasons. We eat for pleasure, for, um, like you said, the taste, the texture, how it's prepared, how it's served, all these different things. Food is social. And if we have these self-imposed food rules, then like say when you travel to a different country and they don't have something that you are thinking that you need to eat every day, um, it's it gives you some flexibility if you kind of release those a self-imposed food rules and try to be more flex, like a flexitarian. I don't know. Is that a term that you've heard flexitarian? It is actually. And it's funny you mention it because I've actually noticed probably the peak use of that term, I would estimate was, was maybe actually a few years ago. I have to say it's, it's actually been a long time since I've heard someone describe their food choices through a flexitarian eating pattern. Mm -hmm. But I do think that really speaks to this desire to have those options. You know, a lot of people are very interested in those social settings of food, whether that's, you know, kind of being a a foodie who checks out new restaurants in your local area, or, um, you know, this traveler who wants to experience different cultures and, you know, the opportunity arises to try something that is new to them. You know, I think that um, flexible approach is, again, critical just to allow yourself to to be able to experience the full offering of of what food can provide. And again, at the same time, just be more sustainable in the long run as far as, hey, I can imagine myself eating this way for the next year, the next five years, the next 10 years, potentially the rest of my life, you know, sustainable in that sense of the word. I love that. Yeah. So it's more like a long-term kind of approach that uh, it's not a diet because diets seem to be short-term and restrictive and most people fall off diets, which actually are harmful to their health in the long run because they usually, a lot of people that are on diets end up you know, gaining all the weight back plus more. So actually, I love that you said that it's more sustainable for the long-term. That's, that hits the nail right on the head. I love that. Right. And when I think about, you know, earlier you asked about some of the benefits of a pescatarian eating pattern, really in order to access those proposed benefits that the research would suggest, it's consistency. We have to consistently consume the nutrients that are found in high prevalence in a pescatarian eating pattern to enjoy some of those benefits, like a reduced risk of of heart disease or a reduced risk of type 2 diabetes. You know, I think when we think of this intuitive eating approach to health, one aspect that sometimes gets overlooked is that gentle nutrition is very much a a tenant or a principle of an intuitive eating approach to to nutrition. And so incorporating some of these foods that we know have been heavily researched and and well studied to link to some of these long-term benefits, you know, the sustainability as far as being able to sustain that eating pattern long-term means that Not only do we ensure that we can maintain that lifestyle that we've chosen for ourselves, but we're also more likely to be able to reap the benefits that the data indicates are are potentially linked to these eating patterns. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. Like it's, uh, it is, it's a good idea to um, like not have food rules per se, but also include a lot of these beneficial healthful elements in the diet for the long term so that you'll be eating you know, more fish, more seafood, more foods that are high in omega-3s for our brain health, for heart health, for prevention of diabetes, like just all of those um, health benefits that to prevent chronic disease, the pescatorian way of eating with some flexibility in, you know, not being so restrictive about like, I have to have this and I can't have this. I think that is a good way to do it. Like you said, it's just you're eating, you're including those foods and those elements that are heavily researched and well studied and we, you will reap the benefits, but it's not also being like super restrictive in that I can't have a piece of meat and I can't have that steak if it's like, you know, once in a while. And it's, I don't know, it's different for everybody and everybody has their own way of eating and their own way of describing 
who they are and how they eat. But at the same time, I really, I'm glad you brought up the whole idea of the food rules and who we are versus what we do and how we eat. Yes, that's such an important distinction because in this day and age, especially for for anyone who spends a lot of time on social media, I think it's easy to lose sight of that, right? We see these very aspirational recipes being made in other people's homes, or there's sometimes this unspoken, you know, statement of, well, if you eat like me, you can look like me, or if you live like me, you can look like me. And I think that, you know, does serve as a a heavy distraction from being able to really align what you value and what you need from your, from your diet um, and apply that in the practical terms, just the day-to-day ins and outs of, of feeding yourself on a regular and consistent basis. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Did you have any, uh, any other questions, Rob? No, I, I mean, I'm just listening to you guys and sort of nodding my head and it's, <laughs> you know, that's, it's a whole thing we could get into the, the whole, um, influence of social media on dieting. And, you know, we've kind of been down that road before and it's, it's good to sort of bring it up again, but, uh, yeah, just acknowledging that this uh, again with with the pescatarian sort of discussion we're sort of having here, it's it's just another one of those diets that we need to just include the good parts of it, but maybe not limit to just eating fish or whatever that diet kind of includes, right? Yeah, and I think that's such a, a tactful way to acknowledge the role that social media plays. We can certainly see it play out in a harmful way, but I'll acknowledge here, you know, it can actually serve a benefit in some cases. You know, I think it's a great connection point for finding people who, you know, maybe make a similar um, style of food that you enjoy or culinary creators who encourage you to try a new to you ingredient. I think when it comes to the practicalities of eating more fish and seafood at home, you know, we've kind of alluded to cost being one of the potential barriers for some folks. But I think another one is just this unfamiliarity with how to cook it in a way that is, you know, appetizing, that tastes good and doesn't feel like, okay, we, we've invested in this ingredient, but it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. And now I'm hesitant to try it again. I think that's a very real concern because again, with the, the cost of food rising, it's one of those considerations where opting for something that is more consistent or more guaranteed to meet your expectations might feel like a safer choice. And You know, I think when it comes to to cooking fish and seafood, one of the biggest benefits that I personally find is that it's a very quick cooking protein in most cases, Mm -hmm. Um, whether you're roasting it, using an air fryer, um, sauteing on the stovetop, grilling, you know, these are these are proteins that take sometimes a fraction of the time as other cuts of, of animal protein. So I think that is one benefit that you may consider as kind of an offset to, you know, hey, some of these foods may be more expensive, but to try something new or different and have a shorter cooking time or try a different style of cooking um, could be a benefit that sort of offsets that in a way. I do have a question regarding the eating fish is one of the things you often hear is that, you know, you should limit how much fish you're eating during the week with certain types of fish, I guess, because of the mercury. Is it, are there other reasons we've discussed, Sandra, or is it just the mercury primarily? Um, Yeah, the heavy metals is the big thing and sustainability like environmentally too. But uh, Kara, do you have any other uh, comments on that? Well, you took the words right out of my mouth. I mean, I think the concerns about heavy metal are are definitely valid. You know, when we're eating these larger fish that are higher up the food chain, you know, they tend to be harvested and processed at an older age. And so that opportunity for mercury or other heavy metals to accumulate in the flesh that we would then be consuming ourselves is is higher and there are specific species so if there's a concern about you know i really love fish and seafood i want to eat it more often but i'm worried about the mercury we can certainly provide a a list of those fish that we might want to to limit but for other things you know it's it's more like hey if there are future opportunities where you can say hey i'd like to have this for lunch and dinner or I want to have more than just a few servings a week. I think that there's definitely a big opportunity to do that without running the risk of accumulating these these heavy metals that could be potentially toxic over time. And then I think with the sustainability piece, another very real and, and valid concern. You know, we're more aware than ever that our food choices have an environmental impact, both at the community level as well as the global level. 
And what I've noticed in the marketplace is that a lot of our seafood providers, whether it's a trade organization or individual brands and companies, are making that information more easy to access. So whether that is right on the front of their label, um, on the back of the packaging, or on their website or social media platforms, you know, they're more forthcoming with the information about how those fish or, or other seafood species are being harvested and, and processed in a way that makes an effort to be more sustainable in the big picture. Absolutely. Yeah, that that's awesome. I see that too with the, a lot of local um, brands and global, I mean, big brands out there that are saying, you know, no dolphins were harmed in the catching of the, the tuna or whatever, right? <laughs> um, yeah. And going back to, you mentioned the uh, cost is a big barrier for people to start to branch out and, and try new recipes. We did a, a great episode on um, budget-friendly grocery tips with Joni Rampala, a dietitian, and that was episode 78. So that I um, would like the audience uh, listeners to go back to that if they are feeling um, pinched with the budget. I mean, like you said, Kara, there's so much uh, like our, the cost of food has gone through the roof. So it is harder uh, to just go shopping with not being on a budget. I mean, it, you kind of need to watch, uh, you know, what you're getting and just use your list and um, get what you need. And like you said, it is sometimes hard for people, especially if they aren't used to cooking. And that's a big thing. I think more and more people are getting back to the kitchen. And I think that's so good. And that's why your cookbook is so I looked at the cookbook and I looked at your website and you've got so many great services. And I just love the picture of all the delicious recipes that you make. And you obviously make it look like it tastes really good. Uh, and I bet it's super flavorful and so healthy too. So um, I really uh, appreciate that. And and in the show notes, we're definitely going to link your website, your cookbook that people can buy, your services, and any other links that you want to share with the audience. But we do have one last question we ask every one of our guests uh Actually, rob do you... we, we have two last questions because <laughs> okay. rob, rob still has another question <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> just wondered kara if you could give us some ideas about uh like shopping for fish you know what should people be looking for especially if like we live on the coast so we've we're lucky we have access to fresh uh, fish and seafood where we live but not everybody does and are, are there ways to sort of shop and include fish uh, if you're going to try to have it on a regular basis, are there things you should be looking for and avoiding? Well, Rob, I'm so glad you mentioned your location because I am unfortunately the opposite. I am about as landlocked as you could possibly be <laughs> That's being what I based thought. in the Midwest of the, yeah. <laughs> the continental U.S. So for me, you know, really frozen in, in canned is the name of the game. I find that you know, while there are very select opportunities to buy what I would consider truly freshly caught fish or seafood, more often than not, if you are far from the coast or don't have that access to freshly caught fish and seafood, frozen can be a great option because it's often flash frozen. We know from a food safety perspective that that's a very effective way to control for pathogens or any potential risks that come with eating, you know, animal proteins. But it's also great for storage and shipment because, again, when we consider the cost of food, we want to ensure that the, the items we're purchasing and bringing home with us actually make it to the point of being cooked and consumed. So buying frozen and keeping it frozen until you're ready to cook, I think, can be a really great strategy. Um, one of the others that I would offer up is to keep an open mind when it comes to how versatile pouched or canned seafood can be. We recently saw some trends on social media around the tin fish explosion in popularity. We saw some really decadent charcuterie boards and appetizers that were featuring a variety of different tin fish. And while those can range in price as well, I keep going back to just a good old fashioned can of tuna. There's a lot of versatility in that because you may think of fish or seafood as, you know, this filet of fish or this whole intact protein. But really, those shelf-stable options can be incredibly simple for a packed lunch. You can turn this into a tuna salad or a salmon salad. These can be incorporated in mixed dishes or other recipes that kind of help you stretch not just the, the food dollars that you're spending, but also increase the likelihood of, hey, this is now a more approachable way 
Um, it's pre-cooked, pretty much ready to eat straight from the can or the pouch. And with just a little doctoring up, you can make a really delicious and really simple form um, of a, a food that can be very pescatarian friendly. Awesome. Oh, I love that. And sardines. I mean, that's one of our favorites. We have uh, canned sardines and I, I've seen uh, recipes where you can open a can of sardines and stir fry them with some onions and garlic and just like you said, put them on a charcuterie board. It's just, ah, oh, there's just so many ways we can use it. And I know that in the past, like talking to people like a decade ago and saying sardines are a really great option because you get the uh, absorbable calcium from the bones that are in canned fish. And it's so good for you, you know, sardines and salmon and uh, people are kippers too. A lot of people just like, <laughs> put turn their nose up and it's like uh -huh. cat food oh I can't take that to work I can't open my sandwich I can't open my um, lunch bag and have everybody smell that it's awful <laughs> <laughs> but it's so good for you so eat it at home and if you can't eat it at work <laughs> absolutely I think you know getting over that I call it like the ick factor it's just sort of that sort of initial ick like thinking about a tinned or canned fish but really I can reference a variety of, of cuisines and cultures around the globe where that is a, a staple of their diet. When you look at the types of fish or seafood that are most commonly included, it does tend to be very small and, and kind of underutilized forms that we as Americans may not typically eat in our, our day to day. Um, my background, my family um, is originally from Korea. And so when you look at Korean cuisines, they're using things like dried shrimp, dried anchovies. You know, these are very flavorful and umami rich ingredients. And as you mentioned, there's known health benefits because of the nutrients that are, are found in these ingredients. But even from just a palatability and flavor standpoint, this is one easy way to start to enrich your other dishes with a, a much richer sense of flavor. And again, reaping the benefits of, of what these um, ingredients can provide us. It's, it sounds like uh, people would benefit from looking at somebody's cookbook and getting some ideas, hey? <laughs> I, I think you, you might be onto something there. I would be more than happy for these recipes to get on your table in some form or fashion. And at the end of the day, I think my final reminder for anyone interested in a, a pescatarian eating pattern is that, again, you know, it's a, a very broad and versatile category of eating to where it, it's not saying every meal or every dish has to include an element of fish or seafood. You can still have those 100% plant-based or vegan dishes. You can include eggs or dairy if you so choose. You may even branch out into other animal proteins. It's really just adapting it in a way that feels like it's aligned with your values and the lifestyle that you want to lead. And I think that's a, a really great way to invite that flexibility in and enjoy some great food in the process. That's awesome. And it leads into our last question. Let's assume we're having a big party and you're invited and it's a potluck. What are you going to bring? Well, I love this question because I have a dish I cannot stop raving about. It is indeed featured on my website. And this summer, it was my second most popular recipe. It is a summer split pea salad. And mm. it's basically exactly like it sounds. I simply cook a few green split peas in a vegetable broth. Um, I'm adding in fresh cherry tomatoes, a can of corn, and a lot of parsley and basil. The dressing is a really light sort of honey mustard vinaigrette style dressing and give that a quick toss. And I suppose if you wanted to make it truly pescatarian, you might add like a skewer of grilled shrimp or maybe a filet of salmon or whitefish to bulk it up. But that is one of my favorites because it, it always seems to impress. Again, it's just a really underrated ingredient as far as the green split peas. And it is very rare that I will be bringing home leftovers. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, it sounds delicious. Oh my gosh. Plus the, uh, just the color. I bet it's just so bright. Uh, the green and the cherry tomatoes and the corn, like just, it's such a, it must be a very colorful dish and just so, um, healthy and delicious. Yes, it is. Um, one that I'm actually thrilled has, has turned out to be as popular as it has because, Again, it's, it's very simple to prepare. It's reliable, stores great in the fridge with no reheating necessary, just an all around rock star of a recipe. So I, I love being able to share that one. When you say it's your most popular, is that based on like people downloading that? Like how do you, what, what do you mean by most popular? 
So when I look at the back end of my website and just get curious about which pages are being visited most often, I find that a lot of people will just go to their Google search bar and type in split pea recipes or, really? you know, huh. what to make with split peas that's not soup. So I think it really is filling a gap and there's kind of this curiosity because again, from a, a budget or sustainability standpoint, maybe this is an ingredient they're curious about. And yeah, they, they end up on streetsmartnutrition.com browsing that recipe card. And my hope is that, you know, a lot of them follow through and actually try it for themselves to see how great of a recipe it really is. Wow, that's neat. It's so I'm I, I'm actually just looking at it. Sorry, Rob, to cut you off. I just I'm looking at this on your um on your website, the split pea salad, and it's got twelve grams of fiber and twelve grams of plant based protein, and it's with that legumes because of the split peas, and it is so beautiful looking. Like oh my gosh, it's so colorful and wow, wow. Sorry, Rob, what were you gonna say? I was just going to say the internet's an interesting place. You know, all the things and information we can get, uh, gather and uh, yeah, it's it's neat that you have that information. Absolutely. Yes. And, and I'm the same way. You know, yes, I am a dietitian. Yes, I may have more experience in the kitchen than the average person. But at the end of the day, I'm a regular person first and foremost. So I'm searching for the same recipes just like everyone else. If we get in a rut or we get bored with what we're routinely making, you know, I think that's another maybe word of encouragement if you're listening to this is to just get interested and try one new ingredient at a time. You know, sometimes these big dietary shifts can feel overwhelming and just taking one new ingredient or one different cooking method, you know, even that can be enough to kind of break you out of a, a stagnant pattern and get you excited about eating these really nourishing foods again. Yeah, that's great advice. Absolutely. And I love that you identified a gap in the kind of in the search for uh, split peas that wasn't soup and you developed this recipe and people are loving it. I think that's awesome. That's what we're all about is helping to impact um, the public and helping them with uh, more nourishing choices and foods that have good ingredients and excellent flavor. And thank you so much. That was, uh, it was really um, eye opening to hear all about the benefits of the pescatorian diet and just the um, intuitive eating approach to all the diets that we talk about and to be more about what uh, what you do versus who you are in terms of vegetarian or non-vegetarian or whatever. And wow, this has been a really um, a great interview. Thank you so much, Kara. Well, I really appreciate you having me. I enjoyed our conversation as well. And yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that there are lots of delicious meals being served after this. <laughs> I know there will be at least one. <laughs> I want to, I'm going to make that for it's sure. It's almost lunchtime. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Kara. It was really uh, enjoyable talking to you. And it's great information. And and like you said, I, I hope some people sort of uh, start including these ideas in their in their diets and, and uh, some new, some new passions are found in the kitchen. I hope so as well. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Okay, we'll thanks talk so again. Much. Cheers. That was a great interview. Very engaging. Yeah, she was really fun to talk to. Yeah, I really... Uh, appreciate that recipe that she said at the end that she'd bring to a potluck, the split pea summer salad. It looks so good on her website. I hope people check that out. Yeah. After listening to the episode and listening to that part, I was I was wondering what her most popular one was because she said that was the second most popular. So now I want to know what the most popular one was. <laughs> we'll have to go we'll have to go see. Well we'll have to have her back on the uh, podcast. Yeah. Yeah there you go. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So people can check out Street Smart Nutrition is her website, Kara Harb Street. That's a clever name. I like that. Yeah. And her book, The Pescatarian Cookbook. Yeah, perfect. I'd uh, be curious to see that as well. So yeah, go check out her cookbook, check out Kara's website, and check out some of her recipes and see if there's some new things that you can include in your diet. You can also check out our website at mywifethedietitian.com. You can email us your questions and comments as well at mywifetherd at gmail.com. And don't forget to rate and review the show. We always appreciate that. And we're also on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. We will be back on Wednesday with Nutrition Nuggets and then again next week, uh, next Monday, with a full episode. So have a great week, everyone. Thanks, Rob. 
Thanks for joining us today on My Wife the Dietitian. If you like what you heard, don't be shy. Leave us a comment or review and be sure to share our podcast with your friends. If you'd like to hear more, hit that subscribe button. You can also follow us on our social media pages for updates, episode trailers, and other odds and ends. For more info and links on what we discussed on today's episode, check the show notes. We'll be back next week with another informative and fun-filled episode. Thank you.